I'm going to say something as we part of what we shared. How many don't believe that, heard what I said, it's important. I think if you, if you hear the story about the Israelites, they were in unity. But it caused them to live in wilderness, and it caused them to be manna dependent, which means is every day they didn't. They, they every day they lived. On, they were waiting, waiting for. I'm gonna use it this word, and I don't like to say they were just waiting for God to do something. But it says if, when you, when they came in the unity of faith, Caleb and Joshua went over, and it says the manna stopped, and they began to eat the fruit of the land. They begin to live, and, and part of what I'm saying is I've got this statement that I've been carrying around for me a while. Is patterns patterns speak speak bigger than actions and a lot of times we always focus on our actions we focus we want to change our actions we want to change it there's nothing wrong with that but what I find a lot of times is we how we base where we get those actions how we try to change it but when we start to look at the cross and what he finished it changed the whole pattern how life was done when Jesus went to that cross the death burial and resurrection that changed the patterns of how everything else followed and I think a lot of times in life, I've, I get around a lot of people, they're good about changing their actions for a time, but what happens if they don't change their patterns, they go right back to those, they go right back to the things that they were freed from at one time, or things they get done from, or, or we develop, or we, we continue to develop patterns, but those actions, I, I'm talking fast, I didn't have too much coffee, <laughs> but I really believe a lot of times in our journeys that we're all about our actions, but we're never paying attention to, never paying attention to the patterns. And you just, you just work that out on your own. But I, I find that when you begin to change your patterns, they begin to change your actions. But the actions follow. It's not vice versa. And a lot of times it's the patterns that have a hard time. You know, if you're growing up or this is how this done or that done or this done, you learn those patterns. Then you repeat those patterns. You know, you look at the Israelites. They were doing things. They learned a pattern for 1,500 years. And they watched, they watched the, there was dates and ceremonies, weeks and foods and cleansings and all these different things. Then Jesus comes along, and Jesus comes along, and he says, I'm going to make a brand new way of doing things. The pattern, the way you think things happen is going to be completely different. From the least to the greatest is going to have the same relationship, the same inheritance, the same, the same of everything. And it's not going to be based on your attempt to get to God. It's going to be based on his attempt to come to you. And as you begin to see that, and Paul, go, Paul, I'm going to get to Colossians here in a minute, but I'm setting it up here, that a lot of times in our journey, a lot of times in our life, we, we want to change, we're so adamant about changing our actions. I don't want to take this hit, don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I don't want to cuss, don't want to swear, I want to have a nicer attitude. Be nice. And those things are fine, but what about if we could change the patterns, do you think that would change, change the action? Instead of just focusing on the action. And I think in Paul's writing and Paul's teaching, Paul is very adamant. He's not just trying to get you to change your actions because he always starts off preaching and ministering to your identity. And then he says, this is your identity. This is the pattern of the new man. Now this is how the, this is how the conduct follows. Amen. You follow me? He always starts off telling you who you are and what's been done. But I find on our journey, especially in, Rome, in Colossians, Paul's always attacking or always having to defend a three-day message. Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. Because we got people that are infatuated with philosophy. Think about it. Does philosophy ever really answer anything? It just is infatuated with itself. Sounds real smart. But at the end where the rubber meets the road from day-to-day -day life, it doesn't really help us out other than makes us learn a lot of big words and say a lot of neat things. And everybody else is going, what, what are you talking about, Willis? You know, but there was a lot of things that Paul was dealing with. Your attempt to God was in your is in this was in the secret intellect. Or there's a lot of things that Paul messed with in Colossians. We're going to talk there today. He was messing with a lot of things where people were wrapped up into the elements of the world where you need to worship these and look to these and this is it. And then there was other people that was all about your how you work and how you do and how you follow. You don't eat pork. You don't do this. You don't do that. And what you you know, and think about it. They they showed up to your house. This is what we don't do. Now that works good for a while until you need to know what to do. When the storm hits, when the storm hits, well, what do we don't do? What do we do? We shout hallelujah. We shout grace to it. We shout greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. And so many times what I'm saying, and we do that. And then he's dealing with people that are just into the experience. I, there's another fancy word for it, but I'm just going to tell you, experiencism. In my own word, and people are all into the experiences, and we're not against that, but they become, this is what everything we're all chasing. 
And Paul says, you know what? Why are you, why are you worshiping and looking to creation when it's the creator we need, to be, we need to be looking at? He did it. He made it. Let's look to him. You're looking for an experience. You're looking for this. You're looking for that. And I'm not picking it. But what we do is we make our patterns and actions follow those things. And Paul says, don't be moved away. Don't be moved away from the substance that is in Christ. And I follow the, the world as they're wrapped up with all of these things. Even Christians are wrapped up with all of that stuff. They come infatuated with the theology and, the, and all the other things in life and statistics of things. But yet they miss out on a revelation how much Jesus loves them. And if you read Ephesians, you read Colossians, Corinthians, he says if you'll be rooted and grounded in love, it'll change everything. But it's not your love for him, it's his love for you. And, what, and hence what happens when we begin to see that, well, not, not change the pattern of how we think, feel, and, and operate. And there's a Dr. Leaf out there says that, this blows my mind, that, that the way you think, the way, the way you think, feel, and choose affects every cell in your body at the same time. Now, I don't know how that works, but I know when you feed fish and the water hits, they all move at the same time, and I cannot calculate how they know how to do all that at the same time. My eyes can't even keep up with that. Now, I'm not, this isn't like, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. But every cell works in your body. At a, this is the word I'm going to, at a quantum, at a quantum level or a quantum speed. Now, that might not sound really exciting, but do you know the speed of light goes 186,000 feet per second? And if you can harness the speed in miles per hour, it would take you around the planet, if you believe it's round. If it's flat, you're on your own. But if you believe it's round... Well, what I'm saying, I can't use the example. But if you believe it's round, you will go around planet Earth seven and a half times in one second. And it says your body operates at a quantum speed or quantum level, energy. And I'm not saying, but, I, but, I, but, but, but they said, that, you know what that amazed me? It says that the quantum energy in your body works 10,000 times faster than the speed of light. Not 10,000, 10,000 times. Now, what's all that mean? All I'm trying to say is what you think and feel and choose is pretty important how it affects the rest of your body. And, the, and she also says this, and I don't know how to put this in words. You just take, she says 99% of your mind, not your brain, your mind is, is on that quantum energy, and she calls it that's the spiritual. She says that's the spiritual speed in which your mind works at. And then she says this, and it's only 1%... Now, she's a neuroscience. Go look her up, Dr. Lee. And, she's a, and, she's a, and she says only 1% of it is physical. <laughs> that doesn't sound great, but here, that sounds really cool, 99% spirit. But here's what she said that blew my mind. She says if the 1% is messed up, the 99% doesn't function. Oh, wow. yeah. So is it not important how, what you think and feel and choose it's, I walk by, I don't walk by faith, I walk by, no, I walk, don't walk by sight, I walk by faith. See, just if I reverse that, that changes the whole thing. All I'm trying to point that out to that all sounds really cool, but I'm just trying to tell you, the Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique. There is a uniqueness to you. You are a new creation. And when we begin to feed off that new creation and that new life and that new way of doing things, it's amazing. We can shout in the midst of the storm. We can have peace in the midst of turmoil. We can live with hope when the world's crashing. We don't live in the unity of how big the giant is, but we live in the unity of faith like Caleb and Joshua says they were of a different spirit, which means they had a different attitude, a different mindset, because the patterns, their life have been changed because of what they received from the, from the cross of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. wasn't just his death, burial, and resurrection, but it was your death, burial, and resurrection. Are we getting anywhere today? So all I'm trying to say is how we, when we bring this out and we attack, we, we, need, we need a major we, most of us live in overload. Overload with everything. I mean, one, one per, you know, in my, in my journey with my wife, and I'm not going to pick on her, I've been married to her for a long time. 25 years. And in 25 years, there's one thing that I'm always able to do, and I don't know how it is, is I can always push that button to get her all upset. But I don't mean it being like, like mad hitting stuff, but I could just, you ever been like those, little, hey, Dad, hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. And then pretty soon they just go, ah! I'm pretty good with that with her. Okay, but she never sees it coming. After 25 years, I can look at the girls and say, hey, watch this. And I'll get her, I'll get her going. Okay? Why did I tell you that? I don't know. 
But there's people, there's people in our journey with actions and patterns. You get people, I want to spend time with you. But their pattern is, they'll say they want to spend time with you in their actions, but their pattern is they'll never show up. Or they might be there, but they're never present because they've got everything else doing. Hence, they got the phone, they got this, they got that, they're somewhere else, they're infatuated with they're this and they're this and they're that, and they're there, but there's never any really dialogue. So what I'm saying is a lot of times patterns speak louder than actions. Now, does this sound condemning? I'm not trying to condemn any. What I'm trying to say is when we can change the patterns, how we think and feel and choose, our actions will follow. And Paul always, always tries to, tries to unpack for you to see that Jesus is the answer for everything. Jesus, Paul says, I became a minister of this gospel, the good news. Whether you're a Gentile, whether you're this, whether you're that, I want to tell you, it's not your attempt to get to him. It's seeing his attempt to get to you. Does that make sense? So that hard drive, sometimes we just need to clear our hard drive. Clear our hard drive. I'm spending a lot of time unpacking this, but we need to clear our hard drive of yesterdays and that old man. We want to bury that. We want to dig the old man up of hurt and pains and this and that and experiences isms. We want to pull up the goosebump moments. We want to pull up this moment and that moment. You know, and, and I'm all for those. I got a lot of those moments, but they don't, they're great. But I'm telling you, there's more life to live than waiting for the manna to show up. Let's eat some fruit and let's embrace this new and living way. I've had lots of those things come, chase the goose. If I spend all my time chasing goosebumps, then what I end up doing is I live unsatisfied. And Jesus says in John 6, he says, he who, come, he who comes to me and he who believes in me will never hunger and never thirst. And I think that's a picture of the Old Testament. They were always hungry and they were always thirsty. And he says, but if you'll come to me, you don't have to live with that man of dependency. You can have a life full of substance. And he hence calls it the abundant life. And what I love about the abundant life, it isn't just to this person or that one. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That includes all of us. Ain't that good news? We're helping you out here. I'm unpacking all that. And and, 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 and we attack, when we have that made, when we have that restart, change that, get rid of all that junk and all that hard drive. I'm telling you, you can live life with a whole lot less. You can live life and receive life. It's not about what he did, she did, or they said, or they didn't say, because your stability isn't found in all that. Your stability is found in what he's done for you, in and through you. Hence, Colossians would say, this is the mystery that's been revealed to you. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isn't that pretty cool? He said, not through, nowhere down through that it ever, that was ever revealed yet. Talks about having a new heart, new name, but he said, this is the mystery. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Your attempt to get to God, your attempt to find God, your attempt to understand philosophy and, 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 and have your efforts and your work and be caught up with all that stuff, he says, that's not where you're going to find them. That where you're going to find them, right inside here. And you're going to find them because it wasn't you looking for him. It was him coming and found you. That'll preach right there. Anyhow, so let's go to Colossians. That was a long intro. That was a long intro. <clears throat> but I like to change, attack some of the filters, the way we think. And I have to unlearn what we've learned. Not just being the unity of how big Goliath is. You know, I think with David, think about David. Did he kill Goliath? We can make sermons and preach and run and shout how cool that is. But think about him. Think about him in that journey that if he just lived from that moment, that's all he did. There had to become a point where it had to be more than this. There has to be more than the story of I just defeated Goliath. Now I got a wife, I got kids, I got a life, I'm king, I got a lot more going on. If he just got up every day, I killed Goliath, that sounds good, but it's not going to help keep him, give him substance where the rubber meets the road. And a lot of you in this room have had experiences, had moments, had different things, and those are all, those are, had deliverances, had all, and those are all good and great, and those are part of the, the heritage of the, what's been given to you as your inheritance in the saints. But you can't just keep going around. I once, I once was an, I, I used to be an alcoholic, but I'm not. I was once a drug addict. I once was this. I once was this. I once was this. Or, or this happened and that. And those are all good. But if that's where you just continue to live life, years down the road, you're going to be wondering, how did I get here? What am I doing? Because that happened for that moment, but it's, there's more to life than I was just delivered from this. Now, you might get upset with me at that, but I'm here. Most people I know, when they got filled with, they received that moment, received that manna for the moment, it was great. But later down the road, they get to where they despise it because that's all they're identified as. 
I used to be this per- This is how they remembered the person that used to be this. Or was it, what about, what about if we could, we could, we can embrace that and go on, but this is who I am today. This is who I am today. That stuff doesn't identify. That stuff doesn't have a voice. I'm a brand new creation filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. And I keep feeding on that good news, feeding on that finished work. And it's brought me a whole lot more substance than what I used to be the day down that road. Because he's feeding off an experience a moment or a time. And what ends up happening is if that's where he stays, that's all he ever sees. But I'm going to tell you, the, the land, the promised land full of Jesus is full of all kinds of life to be lived. All kinds of things to unpack. All kinds of things to see. And it's based on being grounded and rooted in love. Not your love for him, but his love for you. And when we come, when we start to, ah, I got to preach here. I'm just talking. I'm just throwing that out there. Colossians chapter 2. I don't know if I read, I need my glasses. Oh boy, look at that. It says, as you therefore, verse, hey, keep it holy over here. Okay. <laughs> Verse 6, it says, verse 6 of Colossians 2 says, You therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in, does it say a faith or the faith? Established in the faith. What is the faith? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You hear the three-day message, the faith. And it says he wants you to be rooted, built up in him, established in the faith as you have been. Here's that word. As you have been. Everybody say taught. As you have been taught. Abounding in it with thanksgiving. Do you see something there? Is there something about having an attitude of gratitude? Some thanksgiving in your journey and in your life instead of always ram, 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 ram. He says right here, built up, established, faith, being taught, abound, look at, bounding in it in, in thanksgiving. Do you think there's something to your life in thanksgiving? How many people come up and say, hey, thank you? Show some gratitude. What does that do in your journey if somebody just says, hey, I appreciate you? What does that do for you and that other person? Does it build or destroy? Does it keep some grounded and some rootedness? What I'm trying to say is a lot of times in life, that's one of the things we don't like to be thankful about anything. Uh, maybe you do, or maybe you don't. But part of our actions or patterns, some of our patterns is we've not been really taught to be thankful. Maybe you're not. Maybe you are. I'm just throwing that out there. But I've learned that when you have a certain attitude of gratitude, the way you think, feel, and choose, it changes a whole lot to that verse. It changes a whole lot to that verse. And it affects me at a quantum level. Which I don't understand that, but I don't know how all tw- trillions of my... And I'm not making it about body cells. All I'm trying to say is a lot of the world's filled with frustration, aggravation, stress irritation. And it says a lot of times that we can learn to renew our minds and to feed and to feed on the good news of who he is. It'll change the way our patterns are. Hence, it'll change our actions, how we respond to things. And here these people are, he's telling them, man, he goes, be thankful what you've been taught. And, and, And if we go back into the first, if we flip the page back to chapter one in verse 12, he says, giving thanks, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So the, one of the things that Paul was teaching is because of, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you've been qualified. How many people have you've heard conversations that won't go to church because they're afraid it's going to burn up when they walk in or they'll burn up or the building will fall down? Somewhere along the line, somebody told them they weren't qualified and that Jesus wasn't enough. What they did is not point out to the pattern of the cross. They put into their actions where they missed it. But instead of pointing them to the pattern of the cross, because the cross changed everything. You once were, but God doesn't see you as it once were. He sees you as a brand new creation. And it says when you begin to see that, now I'm going to unpack that here in a minute. You ever heard that big fancy word? He's giving you the ministry of reconciliation. I'll read it here in a minute maybe. We'll get to that. Just remember that fancy word. Don't be infatuated with it. But it says, giving thanks to the Father. Who has qual? So who qualified you? Who qualifies you? How many here like to be qualified? Or would you rather be the last person picked on for the team? 
You ever done that? You pick your, I pick, I pick you and you and you and you, and you're standing there going, don't pick me last, don't pick me last, don't pick me last. <laughs> every time. Well, what's one thing about the good news is he picks you, every one of you in this room, I don't know how it works, but he picks you first every time. He picks you first every time. Because he has qualified you. How many like being qualified? Well, don't shout me down on one Sunday, that one. He qualifies you to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And then he goes on and say, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Did you hear that? How many like being delivered? So what Paul is saying, as you receive this stuff and are taught, one thing I want you to see, you've been, de- you've been qualified and you've been delivered. You have been delivered. You've been delivered. Watch this. You have been delivered. He delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, of the son. So he took us out of the, the, the rule and dominion of darkness and brought us into light and inheritance into a new kingdom where Jesus says, I'm not looking for a new kingdom. I'm looking for people to partake already in the kingdom that's been established of righteous peace and joy. And if you and I will partake in that and come into unity and faith in that, holy cow, look out, here we come with love and joy and peace. So he's not looking for, he's not looking for a new kingdom to rule. He says, I've already got a kingdom and I'm inviting you to come and hang out with me in that kingdom. I've qualified you and delivered you. What he's saying is nothing holding you back as as far as my father's concerned. I don't know where that comes from. So he's translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, the redemption of his blood. What he means is there was a payment. You hear me this morning? Watch this. There was a payment. And he said, I'll make that payment. I'll make that payment. Is that part of the message of the cross? Patterns change. No longer you need to bring a payment. He'll be the payment. He'll make the payment. No longer you bringing a tub, a turtle dove, a lamb. No longer you bringing this. He says, I will be the payment. I'll qualify them. I'll deliver them. I'll bring them into a new kingdom. As sons and daughters... And then know that I've redeemed it. I'll make the payment. Now watch this. I'll make the payment in full. What's that payment? In, what did that payment? It didn't, he didn't just go, I'm going to write. The, what is that? I'm just going to write the check. I'm going to write the check. No, that payment was he was beat. He was, he was wounded in every way, inside and outside. He was crushed. That crown of thorns was put on his head. The, he, he, was dripping, he was dripping blood. The thing started in the garden. He dripped sweats of blood in the garden and then released us and put us into a brand new garden. Everything was done, was destroyed in the garden. He put the garden inside you and me and made us a garden so that we could live life. But that redemption, but here's, here's the point I want you to see in that redemption is the payment was made that was your payment, your punishment. And he said, I'll make the payment. I'll endure all of those things as them and for them. Then watch this. He raises, he's baptized and, and, and has a resurrection. Whatever death, hell, and the grave had, he conquered it all and then says, and says, not only will I make the payment, but I'll release, them, I'll release them all from any kind of payment. So it wasn't you were just the payment was made. You were released from any kind of payment. And then he says, not only that, whatever that was that was held against them might be true, but that's not who they are anymore. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? That's great news. That's great news. And this will preach, I love this because it will preach to anybody on the planet. Then he says, the forgiveness of sins. Whew. And it says, and it goes on, it says, He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created through Him and for Him. And, is, and He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. He is, he is the head of the body. What He's trying to say is any, everything you're looking for and trying to find and trying to attempt, He's the answer. He's bigger than. You're trying to look at the, you're trying to, to worship the elements and you're trying to worship this and to look at this and all the moons and the stars and the ceremonies and all that stuff you're looking for. No, he's a creator of all those things. If you'll just look to him, you'll find life in a relationship that's out of this world. It won't be your attempt to impress him. It will be you're impressed upon him by all that he's done for you. Now, isn't that just something amazing? Now, watch, he's, I'm going off that verse. What, is, what has he been teaching them? Do you hear what they've been learning? That's what he's teaching them. 
That's what he's teaching them. I've got to turn the page. Wait a minute. Then he goes on. This is where it starts getting excited for me. And it said, for it pleased the Father. It pleased the Father. You ever heard the word pleased? It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him, here's that word, and by him reconcile all things to himself. Whether things on earth or things on heaven or things... Having made peace through the blood of... What does it say there? The blood of his cross. So it says, and by him... Recon now see the word reconcile? I'm going to cir just circle it and li draw a line out from your head and, and put, put act of God through Jesus Christ. It says, by him there was an act of God... Through Jesus Christ, whether things are in heaven or earth, that he made peace through the cross. Did you hear that? How many are like peace? He made peace. So he's no longer trying to, there's no longer hunt down, run you over, beat you up. It's a, it's a deal. If he's going to if he's gonna hunt you down, he's going to hunt you down with, with his love and with his embrace and with his with his with his ever ending to build you, to empower you, not just to tell you God's saved, but now to empower you to live this life from day to day. Not just be infatuated with some philosophical statement, some philosophical, some infatuated with some experience, some fatu I, Again, I'm not picking on those things, but if that's all we keep digging up, we'll never embrace the life we live today. Hence, the patterns will keep repeating and then wonder why the actions keep showing up. And for me in my journey, when I begin to experience the grace the way God, the way I experienced it, it changed some patterns, the way I think, the way I feel. Hence, it changed my actions, how I did things, how I approached people. You know, there was a time in my life I had, I knew a lot of big fancy words, and I thought that, that I was up here and you were down here. Oh, don't shout me down at once here. But I was humble. Because I knew more and understood more than maybe this person did because of this denomination or that denomination or this, that, or the other. And then we begin to com compare and build and do and what we could preach and what we couldn't preach and what we couldn't do. And then what happened is when grace started to show up in my life, I remember sitting there and this dude, was, this dude was tattooed up. He was higher than a kite, tears in his eyes, and the Holy Spirit said, Holy Spirit said the same salvation, the same cross that paid for your salvation, paid for his salvation. And all of a sudden, that began to change the patterns of how, how people, how, how I saw and how I did. And so, soon I realized it was never about climbing a ladder. It was always about seeing him coming down to the ladder to embrace all of us. And that began to change the patterns, but began to change, and then that began to change my actions. Because what it did is now it showed me it wasn't just, it wasn't just my attempt and how good I could, how good I can open up the can and eat the spinach. It was allowing me to feed on what he provided and given to me. It wasn't just that he qualified me, but as he qualified that person just as much. Are you hearing me this morning? And I believe the more that the world hears that, that message, they'll begin to change their patterns, hence it'll change their actions. It'll change their conduct, it'll change their understanding, it'll change their deal. Change how they deal with things and do things. You know, because most of us live, did I say this before? Most of us live on Sunday, man, we're charged up. Are we not? We go home, woo, I can do this. Ah! Then Monday comes. Or maybe you go home, you might have some frozen ice, water pipes. Or something happens, and pretty soon you still got that motivation. You still, ha, hoo, hoo, still, hoo, hoo, hoo. Then Tuesday comes along. I'm going to go around, I'm going to tell everybody about Jesus. This is good stuff. When you start telling people about Jesus, instead of being excited about it, they're just like, well, you're just one of them Bible-thumping, talking people. You're just infatuated with your own language, and you're talking a language. They got no clue what you're saying. But you're impressed by it. And you remember I talked last week about how Nordia, how Nordia, or the week before, how Nordia's language, we began to learn the language and stuff. Well, Casey was talking to her the other day, and she's been back in Spain long enough that when they were talking on their phone, that Nordia had forgotten some of that language. And I thought, boy, that'll preach. You start distancing yourself away from the good news and looking to everything else. You'll start forgetting that language of how good God is, and you'll begin starting to speak like the world does. And I thought, boy, that'll change. That'll change something around there. Then Thursday, so you're doing all this, and then by Wednesday, by Wednesday, you know, what? Well, man, people don't really care. Why should I care? God loves me. That's it. It's internal. Woo! Ah! Then by Thursday, you just ignore it. 
Friday, you just do your own thing. Crank up the, crank up the BGs or whatever it is. <laughs> just live in your own little world. Ah! Going down the road, the wind it down. Then Sunday comes, Saturday comes along and you're going, <sighs> got to go to church tomorrow. <laughs> so when you start on, I got to go to church tomorrow. Then you go to Sunday, and you reflect everything for the week, and then you're going, then we do this whole thing again. Am I, anybody ever been that way? Yeah. I'm here to tell you, that is not the life that he died to give us. That is not the substance that he's talking about. That's not the quality of life that he's talking about. He's talking about some real substance, some, some real reality, that each and every one of you matter that you have greatness, uniqueness in you as anointed sons and daughters that get to carry the message of reconciliation. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, it says that you are a new creation in Christ. Old is past, behold, all things are new. And he gave you and me the ministry of reconciliation. What is that ministry of? That you've been qualified, that you've been cleansed, that you've been delivered, and it wasn't by your attempt, wasn't by your doing, but it was an act of God through Jesus Christ, a three-day message that makes all the difference in how you live life. So he's saying the pattern of the cross changed everything. The pattern of the cross changed everything. Whew, isn't that something? I don't even know where I'm at now. Then he goes on in verse, he made peace through the blood, on, of his cro made peace through the blood of his cross. Can we keep going? And he says, and you once who were alienated in were alienated in enemies in your mind. Could your mind be the way you think, felt, and chose? You were enemies in the way you felt, the way you thought, the way you chose. How do you want to say that? You were enemies in your mind. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not, there's nothing that I can bring to the table. And you're right. There's nothing that you can. But if that's all you focus on, you'll never come to the table. But if you can see that he's got a fine cuisine table that's already been purchased and paid for, if you'll come and eat the fruit of this, there'll be more and more for you to feed from. All of a sudden, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to get up. In turn, you're going to have to leave the table of despair. You're going to have to leave the table of doubt. You're going to have to leave the table of fear and say, you know what? I'm moving to a new home. I'm moving to a new location. I'm changing some of the patterns of how I think and feel and choose, and hence my actions are going to follow. Because I'm moving to a new location called the finished work of Jesus Christ. i got to get up and leave this bondage, this Egypt. Remember when they went? Remember, think about this. They're in, they're, they've been, I thought about this a lot. They're delivered. God delivers them miraculously through all the different things in Egypt. Cross the Red Sea. Takes some bitter water and takes it, makes it sweet. They sing a bunch of hallelujahs. And then within a few more, a few hours, this is what they say. It'd been better for us to be in Egypt and have our bellies full and die than to be out here in this wilderness suffering from hunger. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I ain't never seen no water part in the Red Sea. I never, and we're not talking just a few church people. We're talking thousands and thousands of people. And they say this, we would rather be in bondage, not be known, be known as, not even known by my name, but I'm going to be known by a slave with a number. And have my belly full and die in bondage than to, to live in this freedom that's been given to me. Because why? Because they couldn't trust that God would take care of them because they couldn't see it. But they could see the bondage and thought, that will sustain me. Hence, they were deceived in their thinking and they alienated themselves from what God wanted for them. I'm just throwing that out there. And it's alienated in mind by their wicked works. What? And it says, now he has reconciled us in the body of his flesh through the death, watch this, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. You ever heard me say that? Now watch this. And I believe the reconciliation part is this. It didn't say that he saved you. It said that he did everything for you. And if you'll receive this reconciliation, he says, now is the day of salvation. He says, I did everything so that you could come boldly to the throne of grace. I did everything to qualify you, to deliver you, to reconcile you, to redeem you. I did everything through, the, through my son. It was my act through my son for you. And he says, this is the day of reconciliation. But your response is, I'm going to receive this and say thank you. My response is, I receive this and say thank you. 
That is the message of the cross that you, that you receive this reconciliation. <laughs> Isn't that something? And it says as you receive this, watch this, as, you re- as this reconciliation was an act of God, but you receive this, I'm a, it, and it says, uh, there I am, okay, in the body of his flesh through the death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach. Holy. Did it say you worked to be holy? It said he made you holy. Did you hear me say that this morning? I might say, oh, preacher, you're getting too far ahead of yourself. No, Paul says, these are the things you've been taught. Don't let anybody cheat you or deceit you or take you away from these things. He says, don't let anybody take you away from those things. You, you are holy. Now watch this. You're holy. You've got a brand new heart. you got his heart. You've been clean. And it says you're blameless. Boy, that's a tough one. How many here can point fingers? I didn't hear nothing over here. It says you're blameless, faultless. And then it says above reproach. What it means is accusations don't have a voice in your life. It isn't there a place in the Bible where it says he's an accuser, the the enemy is accuser of the brother. So the enemy is going to try to come and accuse you to try to tell you you're not qualified, you're not delivered, you're not redeemed. It's your act, not his act. It's your attempt, not his attempt. And you're going to wear yourself out, get so cluttered up with life, trying to never, never embrace an amazing relationship because everything's so cluttered because you're making it all about you. Or you're making it about your hurt, your pain, your habit. I just want significance in my life. I want some certainty in my life. And those are all good. You want some significance? You can get it by feeding on your pain and hurts, or you can get some significance by feeding on what he's done for you and change you from the inside out. And it says above reproach. It means that when the enemy tries to come in, the, you know, well, you're just not doing enough, brother. He's going to try to accuse you that there's more to it than what there is. He's going to try to accuse you you're not doing enough. He's going to try to accuse you. I mean, I hear people all the time, no, the problem is the Christians aren't doing their part. And we'll get all kinds of amens. Most of the time, the Christians, if we want to do that, is because most of the time, most Christians don't, don't fall from an identity. They just fall from actions trying to get an identity. And what happens is that only carries them so far down the yellow brick road. And pretty soon, the guy with the heart, the brain, and the courage, they all disappear. And you're there by yourself going, we're back to Monday again, trying to redo the whole thing to Sunday again. And repeat it over and over and over. Something's got to change. Yep, we've got to see the pattern of the cross and what it did. You know, you know how important I think it is here? Because he says you're blameless, you're holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Then here's the part. If indeed you continue in the faith. So we're going to use that and go, unless you do this, unless you do that, unless you do this. Well, I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, that's not what it's saying here. It's saying, I'll keep reading it here. It says, if you, if indeed you continue in the faith, what's the faith? The finished work of Jesus Christ. Is that right? The death, the the, the three-day message. If you indeed continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to you, Every creature under heaven of which I became, I, Paul, became a minister. So what he's saying is all these things are trying to stir you up and move you away. But since all these things have been done for you, and if you'll hold on to it, grounded in steadfast, you'll not be moved away. Did you hear me this morning? Go look it up in your, in your how you, the word if indeed actually means since. Since you, since you, since you. Continue in the faith. Since you continue in the faith, grounded. Doesn't Ephesians talk about being grounded in his love, rooted in his love? Grounded in what he has done for you. Steadfast. Woo! I love that one. Immovable. What's the word? Immovable. I said immovable. M, in, just can't be moved. You can't be moved. Since you can't be moved, since you are grounded oh, and are not moved away from the good news, the good news, the gospel, that's what gives you hope for each and every day. That's what you hold on to. That's what you feed from. That's what you roll from. This is what you do. This is how the, the, the cross, the patterns of the cross change everything. Changed everything. Changed everything. Whew. 
don't know if that, I lost some in Malachi. You know how that, but go back here. I get all excited about this because I watch a lot of people, they suffer and they struggle and they get frustrated and they think God's out to get them and things aren't because every time something goes wrong or they're, they're having a freak out, something's going on, they go, this happens, it happens, right away they freak out. And I think a lot of times they freak out because what is, that's what they've been taught. How many times I've been to the hospital, I just hope I make it. Somebody been to be like Sister Debbie, been in church all her life. Maybe not. But she's been in church all her life, then she's at the hospital laying on the bed and says, as far as I'm concerned, you don't get any better than her. She's the saints of saints. Amen. Okay? And then she says, I hope I make it. <laughs> and I've been in places like that where they say that. That tells me some of the times that they were making, it was more than their actions than it was the patterns of feeding on the cross. And I'm here to tell you, I want to attack that and change that because as long as we're infatuated with that, we're going to miss out on living an abundant life that in the midst of the storm, in the midst of whatever, that I can find some contentment and some stability in my journey because when those things are coming, I'm going to be steadfast and I'm going to be immovable. Not on my standing, but on his standing. Then if we back up here, Paul says, he says that the things you've been taught don't be stirred and moved away. How many hairs can be stirred and moved away with things? Oh, don't, don't shout me down on that one. You know, we have life events. Things happen. Relationships fall apart. Uh, health issues, work issues, uh, life issues, uh, things you like and dislike. All of those things are real deals. And sometimes we value whether those work out or don't work out, whether God loves us or not. A lot of the world does. And he's saying, no matter what, I love you. If you pick door A, B, or C, guess what? I'll be with you for every one of them. But we'll spend our journey of our life just sitting back talking about door A, B, and C. When he says, and we'll just have a conversation and we'll never experience anything because we just spend all our time talking about it. He says, whatever door you pick, just pick it in love. Just pick it and let's go through it and let's embrace it. Quit having a conversation. Let's bring some execution to some decisions and some patterns of how we do life. Are you getting anywhere with this? The Lord loves you. The work that he's done for you is amazing. This reconciliation, this act, this act of God through Jesus Christ has changed everything in how we do life and how life's been presented to us. You're no longer an alien. It says you're part of a family. You're no longer, he's no long, there's no longer accusations to beat you up and thump you and run you over. There's, there's, there's amazing words of deliverance and empowerment to embrace life in every situation, every day where life meets the road. It's not some foreign language, but it's a brand new language. And as you begin to understand and feed on that language, it will change how you do life, how you embrace life, how you see life. It will change how you do, do things with your husband, with your wife, with your worker. There might be people you just despise, but, but it doesn't mean you become their buddies, but you change the way you approach it, and pretty soon they might become your best friends. Or you might just pick on this person or that person, but I'm here to tell you, when you feed on Jesus, it will ch when you begin to feed on that holiness and that blameless and no accusation, that doesn't mean you walk around. It doesn't mean you might not get your feelings hurt. Condemnation is taken care of. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But someone might tell you, hey, <laughs> Lionel, <laughs> you got some bad breath, brother. <laughs> he might, you know, you need to take a shot. I wasn't going to do this over here. <laughs> so... Or what I'm saying is we might do some things. Shame might hurt our feelings. But Paul says, some of the things I said, I don't have any regret because it made you go and brush your teeth and put some gum in your mouth. Right. <laughs> it might be simple, but he says some things to try to get your attention. He's not trying to condemn you, but there's some things he's saying, listen, some of these actions, some of these conducts don't line up with what God has finished for you in Christ Jesus. And as you begin to see that and understand it, it's not a, I'm not beating you up, but what I'm saying is, brother, a toothbrush and some crest will go a long ways in your journey. <laughs> A shower, a cleansing, feeding on this word, feeding on what is for you and, and rightly divided will change a lot how you do life. Okay, I'm going to close. I've gone a long time. Thank you. Where am I at? I wing it. Listen to him. This, if you read, I just... I'm infatuated this because I've, here, here's where I've been as, as far as being, I'm infatuated because there are so many voices out there that are just distracting and taking, taking, taking the Christian community and just, and, and, and just making it a mess. 
And I find most of the stuff that's making a mess, they got billions of people following, but it doesn't do anything to help the person with where they meet the road, where the rubber meets the road to help them everyday life. It's projected way out there, or it's talking about way back here. And I don't need, and those things are great, but I need something that helps me here for today. I need something that helps me with my wife and my kids and the decisions and the things that I'm going, things that are happening. I don't need something way out here. I need some substance for here. And there's so many, and we're all wrapped up over here and wrapped up over there, but nobody wants to grab a hold of right here. I want to be present. And we end up, I think, missing out because we're missing out because we're looking for something that's already been given to us. That it wasn't by our attempt, it was by his attempt. Amen? And then I'm not going to read all the rest of it here, but it says, it says all I'm saying is don't be moved away from the simplicity that is found in Christ. Don't be moved away that he's qualified you, that he's cleansed you, and that he's redeemed you. Don't be moved away from the simplicity that he paid the price, that he is not mad about you, but he's madly in love with you. He received you from any, every, any, every and any payment, and all he wants for you is to, be, is to receive this salvation, embrace this newness, this newness of life, and not just, through, just by a bunch of actions, but let it change the way you think, feel, and choose and operate in everywhere and everything you do. Let it become not just something you do good on Monday, you fail Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and get recharged. Let it be something that you know that each and every day is just as important as the other one. That he was with you on Sunday, he'll be with you on Monday. He'll be with you on Tuesday. Yep, there might be some issues, but you know what? In the midst of those issues, like that song we sang, I'm going to keep shouting hallelujah. And I'm going to thank him for wisdom and discernment and understanding to continue to grow and unpack this in my life. But first, got to realize I can come to the table. That's part of the pattern. Not the action. The pattern is, i got to change the pattern. I can come to the table. And it won't be him pointing fingers to go brush your teeth. You're going to have an appetite to want to go brush your teeth. You're going to have an appetite for a new hip and a new hop and a new kick and a new step. And then I close with this. And here's what, I'm going to read that again. As you therefore have received, received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. As you have been taught, abounding with it with thanksgiving. So what do we do with these, some of the things I read in Colossians chapter 1? See what he's teaching you. See what the message is. Receive it for yourself and then be thankful for it. Be thankful for it. And I promise you, when you start to be thankful for it, that gratitude will change you from the inside out. That gratitude will give you a new, new hip and a hop in your step. And, and it's not you trying to, tell, to show people that you're a Christian. You're just going to be the way you live life. It will just ooze out of you effortlessly. And it won't be you pointing fingers, beating up. It'll be you embracing and loving people wherever they're at. And that's a challenge for most of us because we think as Christians our job is to fix people. Point out their, and I'm here to tell you, my job is not to fix anybody. My job is to be rooted and grounded in this love, and as I am loved, I love others. And, point, and that's pointing people to Jesus. Because what, what makes you tick? What makes you roll? Because I don't want to live manna dependent in my life anymore. I want to live that way. I want to cross to the other side, and I want to eat some fruit of this new creation. I want to eat some fruit and build my life on a new, a new pattern that was brought to me through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but he made me alive with him and seated me with him. And I'm going to, that whatever quantum speed that is, that's pretty amazing. And it'll change the way I think, feel, and choose. It will change how I respond and live and do life. In the midst of pain, I can still have knowing me that we're good. I'm not, I'm not hoping that I make it. I'm thankful that I can make it in and through him. Amen? And, and I'll close with this. Do you want to live your life just being, I'm going to stand up there. I'm not going to pick on you. You ain't been here forever. Let's do a couple. But no, I'm not even, you just sit down. Do you want to live your life as someone that was just a, a divorcee or somebody that missed it or didn't make it or, or this or that? Or do you want to know that I'm a brand new person in Christ Jesus? And every day, in every, in every way, you're, he's still making us new. It says in that right after, it says, of his fullness you have received. Think about that. Of his fullness you have received. And as we awaken to that, that fullness, I think, has been given to us. And we have the rest of our lives to learn and discern how to unpack that and embrace that. Of his fullness you have received. Amen? I want to live 
man independent. I want to live new creation dependent that was brought to me through, through, through Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. And Paul says, that's what I become a minister of. Amen? All right, stand to your feet. Did you get anything out of this today? Thank you for being here. Thank you for hanging out with us. I don't know if my watch is fast or slow. I have such quantum speed in my body that my watches don't keep up with me. <laughs> That's a fact. They don't keep up with me. So I'm going to have Jimmy come up here and dismiss us. But Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for each and every person that is here. As we, Lord, we just give, Father, I just give you thanksgiving and praise. I thank you for continuing ministering to the hearts and lives of each and every person here. Continue to minister the value. Continue to, diminue, to continue to minister to them the, 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 the status of what you've placed them in is so, is, is so amazing. The, some of the, thing, the things that they're going through and the things that they're, uh, that's a mystery to them. Father, I pray that there'll be some clarity and some certainty brought in their heart and their mind that, that they'll feed off of. They'll feed off of how they got qualified. They'll feed off of how reconciliation was put to their account. And they'll receive, they'll receive and eat from that goodness, that good land that you have brought to them. And Lord, I pray that you'll just, you'll just bring brightness and light into every area of their life. And when they're being stirred or things are coming up to move them away and frustration and aggravate, whatever it is, they're being stirred to move up. Father, I thank you that they'll rise up from inside, not not just with grit in their teeth, but they'll rise up knowing the good news, the hope that's been brought to them. And it's not about grit in their teeth. It's about receiving. It's about receiving of that fullness that's been given to them and allowing that fullness to manifest in their lives in every day, in every way. And I thank you that they continue to embrace that language, embrace that new and living way. That, Father, that they, that they live with, with a joy and a peace in their eyes, not as a roller coaster, but sustainably solid and stable with some certainty that you qualified them and that you, that you it's your fullness that's in them. And, Father, I thank you. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. I don't know where you're at, brother. I'm looking all around. <laughs> all right, give him a big hand. All right, let's send it this way. Put your hand on your heart and say, I'm quick. I'm quick. And I'm sharp. And I'm sharp. And I'm bright. And I'm bright. And I'm smart. And I'm smart. I'm healthy. I'm healthy. I'm wealthy. I'm wealthy. And I'm wise. And I'm wise. Say, I am dearly loved. Dearly loved. And cherished by God. And cherished by God. Let's end this way. Say, something good. Something good. Is going to happen to me. It's going to happen to me. This week. This week. Something good. Something good. Is going to happen through me. <laughs> this week. Amen. Well, God bless you. Don't forget to tell Pastor Dan happy birthday. Oh. And Brother Jerry, it's so good to see you today. So we love you. God bless you. Have a great week.